بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه ومن اهتدى بهداه أما بعد tonight إن شاء الله we take the first hadith uh, under the chapter which Imam Al Bukhari رحمه الله uh, put in his Sahih titled uh, Allah Azza wa Jal has 90 or 100 names less one. So Allah Azza wa Jal has 99 names. That's the heading of the chapter. And we take the first hadith under this chapter <coughs> regarding Allah Azza wa Jal having 99 names and we will go through the explanation as to what this means. But Imam al-Bukhari rahimahullah, he said, عن أبي هريرة أن رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم قال إن لله تسعة وتسعين اسم مئة إلا واحدة من أحصاها دخل الجنة And then he said, أحصيناه حفظناه the hadith of Abu Huraira radiallahu ta'ala anhu that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said Allah has 99 names, 100 less one. And he who memorizes them all by heart, which means perfects them, enters paradise. And he who memorizes them, meaning perfects them, enters paradise. So this hadith, the hadith of Abu Huraira radiallahu ta'ala anhu is teaching us that Allah azza wa jal has names. And in this particular hadith, it mentions 99 names. And this, my brothers and sisters, does not mean that Allah azza wa jal's names are restricted to 99 names only. As we will see. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam saying Allah has 99 names. Whoever perfects them enters Jannah does not mean Allah only has 99 names. Rather what it means is that from Allah azza wa jal's many names, he has 99 names that we know of in the ahadith, in the Quran and the sunnah. Whoever perfects those 99 names enters Jannah. So it does not mean Allah only has 99 names. And this is similar to when someone says, I have 100 dinar which I have prepared to give in the path of Allah. If someone says, I have 100 dinar which I have prepared to give as a sadaqah in the path of Allah, it does not mean the person only has a hundred dinar. He has more than a hundred dinar, but he has that one hundred to give in the path of Allah Azza wa Jal. So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam saying that Allah has 99 names does not mean Allah only has 99 names. And this is the belief of Ahlul Sunnati wal Jama'ah based on the Dalil from the Quran and the Sunnah. Because Allah Azza wa Jal's names, my brothers and sisters, are not restricted to a particular number. Even when you study the Quran and the Sunnah, if you were to derive the names of Allah Azza wa Jal from the Quran and from the authentic hadith, it exceeds over 99 itself and that's dalil that Allah's names are not 99. I remember one of my teachers who taught us asma wa sifat in Medina, he told us if you derive just the names that we know for Allah, it exceeds over 105 names, authentic names of Allah. So that shows Allah's names are not limited to a number and the correct opinion is we do not know the reality of how many names Allah has. We only know the ones Allah has taught us. And this hadith only teaches us that from his many names are 99 names. These 99 names that we know of, whoever perfects them enters 
paradise. And the greatest proof, the strongest proof that Allah Azza wa Jal's names are not limited to a number is the hadith which is found in Musnad Imam Ahmad rahimahullah. In Imam Ahmad rahimahullah's famous hadith book where the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said in the hadith that no person is inflicted with ham, with worry, wala hazan, and sorrow. And says, so no person is inflicted with worry and sorrow. And then they say, Allahumma inni abduka ibn abdik ibn amatik. O oh Allah, I am your slave, the son of your slave, and the son of your female slave. Nasiyati biyadik, my forelock is in your hands and your ruling applies to me and you are just in what you decree. Then the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, As'aluka bi kulli smin sammayta bihi nafsak. Look, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, I ask you, O oh Allah, through every name that you named yourself with. أو علمته أحدا من خلقك. And the names that you taught to someone from your creation. أو أنزلته في كتابك. And the names that you revealed in your books. Then the Prophet ﷺ said, أو استأثرت به في علم الغيب عندك. And the names that you kept hidden in the unseen. So that part of the hadith, the Prophet ﷺ is asking Allah through his names that he kept hidden in the unseen. So that shows us Allah did not reveal to us every name of his. Because there are names of Allah that he kept hidden to himself in the unseen. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in another hadith, he says that on the day of judgment, he will praise Allah with a praise that he does not know of in this dunya now. And the ulama said that that praise of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, which he does in the next life, which he does not know of now in this dunya, are the names that Allah kept in the, uns- in the hidden unseen. Allah reveals them to Muhammad Wasallam in the next life. So Allah Azza wa Jal, His names are not restricted to 99 or to a particular number. We don't know how many names Allah has. Because He has names kept hidden with Him in the unseen as the hadith shows. But what this hadith means is that whoever perfects these 99 that we know of, enters Jannah. So according to this hadith, Allah Azza wa Jal's names are three types. Allah's names are three types. Number one, the names that he named himself with and taught them to whoever he chose from the Malaika or the Anbiya. That's the first category of Allah's names. The ones that he named himself with and he taught them to someone from his creation. The second are the names that he revealed in the books or in some of the books and he taught them to his creation that way by revealing them in the books. And the third type are the ones that he kept hidden in the unseen and did not reveal to anyone from his creation yet. So these are the three categories of Allah's names. The Prophet ﷺ said, whoever memorizes them enters Jannah. Man ahsaha dakhal al-Jannah. Whoever memorizes or perfects them enters paradise. And the important question, my brothers and sisters, what does it mean to perfect Allah's names? 
Because this is important for us to know. Because our Prophet wasallam is saying, whoever perfects these 99 names enters paradise. So perfecting Allah's names is a gate to Jannah. So how do I perfect Allah's names? What does it mean to perfect Allah's names? Ibn al-Qayyim rahimahullah said, regarding perfecting the names of Allah azza wa jal, three points. He said perfecting Allah's names means, number one, to perfect them by memorizing them and memorizing their number of the ones revealed to us. So the first part of perfecting Allah's names is to memorize them. That's the first part. But it's not the only part. Because that's too easy. Because then it will mean if you just memorize 99 names, you enter paradise. No. Memorizing them is part of the perfection. Number two, he said, to understand their meaning and what they indicate to. Very important. To understand the meaning of his names and what they indicate to. For example, his name is Ar-Rahman, which means the most merciful. And he indicates to his vast amount of Rahmah. His name is Al-Aziz which means the Almighty, and he indicates to his Izza. This is part of perfecting the names, that you understand their meaning and what they indicate to. And finally, number three, that you supplicate Allah with them, that you make dua to Allah with his names. So if you do these three things, memorize them, understand their meaning and what they indicate to, and call Allah with his names, then you have perfected his names. So that's regarding the hadith that Allah Azza wa Jal has 99 names, 100 less one. Whoever perfects them enters Jannah. And as we mentioned, my brothers and sisters, this does not mean Allah's names are restricted to 99. It means from his names are 99 names. Whoever perfects them enters paradise. Then Imam al-Bukhari rahimahullah moves on with the next chapter. And he says, Babu su'ali bi asma'illahi ta'ala wal isti'adhati biha. He said, chapter, asking Allah with his names and seeking refuge with them. Asking Allah through his names and seeking refuge through his names. To ask Allah through his names and to seek refuge through his names. And the word su'al or asking means to ask Allah by lowering yourself before him. Because when you ask Allah for anything, you are lowering yourself to Allah with submission. And al-isti'adha, or seeking refuge, is to seek refuge and protection from the one capable of removing and preventing harm. When you say, A'udhu Billah, what are you doing? You are seeking protection from the one who can prevent and protect you from harm. And that's why we seek refuge with Allah from everything harmful. That's why you say, A'udhu Billahi min shaytan rajim Because the shaytan is harmful, so you seek refuge with Allah who can prevent that harm. And that's the meaning of isti'adha. And these two things, my brothers and sisters, Asking Allah through his names and seeking refuge through his names are from the greatest types of worship for Allah. And Imam al-Bukhari rahimahullah, he intended to show the way a person is to call and worship Allah with his names. 
Because Allah wants us to call him through his names. And that's why Allah Azza wa Jal said, وَلِلَّهِ الْأَسْمَاءُ husna." Look what he said. The first thing, to Allah belongs the best names, فَدْعُوهُ biha. So I call him through them. So Allah wants us to call him through his names. To say, Ya Allah, Ya Rahman, Ya Rahim, Ya Ghafoor, Ya Wadud. Allah loves this when you call him through his names. And a small but beautiful benefit for you to learn and to know is that when you call Allah Azza wa Jal by saying Allahumma, uh, we say it many times. The word Allahumma, as the ulama have mentioned, means you are calling Allah with every name of His. Just the word Allahumma. So make that a habit in your dua. That when you ask Allah or call Him, use the word Allahumma. By saying Allahumma, it's like you called Him with every name. Ya Allah, Ya Rahman, Ya Rahim. Think of all Allah's names. You've combined it in that word Allahumma. That's how powerful and great that word is. And the Prophet ﷺ used to frequently use it. Then Imam al-Bukhari rahimahullah mentions the hadith under this chapter. Once again, the hadith of Abu Huraira radiallahu ta'ala anhu, where he said, عن أبي هريرة رضي الله تعالى عنه عن النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم قال إذا جاء أحدكم فراشه فلينفضه بصنفه بصنفة ثوب ثلاث مرات وليقل باسمك ربي وضعت جنبي وبك أرفعه إن أمسكت نفسي فاغفر لها وإن أرسلتها فاحفظها بما تحفظ به عبادك الصالحين Abu Huraira radiallahu ta'ala anhu narrated that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, when any one of you goes to bed, he should dust it off, meaning his bed, three times with the edge of his garment. And he should say, Bismika rabbi wa ba'tu jambi wa bika arfa'u in amsakta nafsi faghfir laha wa in arsaltaha fahfadha bima tahfad bihi ibadaka salihin. So the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam in this hadith is teaching us the dua or one of the ad'iyah to make before you sleep. And that when you go to your bed, it is a sunnah to dust your bed three times using your garment. So like this, the edge of your garment, the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said. And the truthful servant, my brothers and sisters, is always in a state of ibadah to Allah. The true servant of Allah is always in a state of worship. And very rarely is he ever away from worshipping Allah in his worldly affairs. When he leaves his house, he says something that makes him in a state of worship. When he enters his house, when he eats, when he drinks, when he sleeps, waking up, leaving the family, dealing with the people. The true servant of Allah Azza wa Jal is always in a state of worship. And that is why the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi taught dua like this one and others, which is calling Allah through his names. So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said he should dust it off three times with the edge of his garment. If you don't do it with the edge, it's permissible. If you do it with your hand, or you do it with something else, anything. The purpose of this is to wipe away anything which may be harmful in the bed. There might be a spider, a scorpion. It could be something that's harmful. So the sunnah teaches us to protect ourselves. And that's why the sunnah is to dust your bed before sleeping. And he commanded three times in order to be certain. And because it's a witter number, it's an odd number. The Prophet ﷺ used to love odd numbers 
Because Allah Azza wa Jal is one, which is an odd number. So any time the Prophet Sallallahu could make something an odd number, he would. He said in this dua, Bismika Rabbi wa ba'tu jambi. In your name, O my Lord, I place my jamb, my side, meaning I lie down. Since sleep is considered a form of death, sleep, my brothers and sisters, is a form of death. And a person may die during his sleep. He turns to Allah by mentioning his name, calling him and seeking his blessings, asking Allah for his maghfirah, which is to cover his sins and to forgive them. That's why you make this dua before sleep, because sleep is a form of death and you can actually die in sleep. It's possible. Allah Azza wa Jal says in the translation of the verse, Allah takes the souls at the time of their death. Allah says, He takes the souls at the time of their death. And those that do not die, He takes during their sleep. So Allah takes the soul during sleep. Then He keeps those for which He has decreed death. So every soul at the time of sleep, Allah takes it. And if a soul is decreed to die during sleep, what happens? Allah does not send the soul back to it. He's taken it and he doesn't return it. As for the others that have not been decreed to die, he returns their soul. Look how close you actually are to death just by sleeping. If it's not for Allah Azza wa Jal commanding your soul to return to your body, it would never return. And that's why it is from the sunnah to make these types of dua. Then the Prophet ﷺ said, وَإِنْ أَرْسَلْتَهَا And if you return my soul back to my body, O oh Allah, فَحْفَظْهَا Protect my soul. بِمَا تَحْفَظْ بِهِ عِبَادَكَ الصَّالِحِينَ Protect my soul with that which you protect your righteous servants. And what this means is, O oh Allah, if you return my soul to its body, then protect it from the shayateen and protect it from misguidance and protect it from all harm. With your protection that you protect your awliya with. So, in this hadith, my brothers and sisters, there is a complete surrender to Allah. Subhanallah, this dua, if you understand its meaning, it is a complete surrender to Allah at the time of sleep. Oh Allah, I've put my soul in your hands. Protect it. And it teaches us that we need Allah and that we ask Him because we need Him. And all of this is from Tawheed and the worship of Allah. And the hadith is also Dalil that we must remember Allah at the time of death in order for the minor death to be on the name of Allah. And there's nothing greater than dying. And the final words that you died upon is the remembrance of Allah Azza wa Jal. That's why you remember Allah before sleep, because you could die. And if you do die, you died in a state where mentioning Allah was the last thing you did. And how magnificent is that? And all of this is taught to us in the verse where Allah Azza wa Jal says, قُلْ إِنَّ صَلَاتِي وَنُسُكِي وَمَحْيَايَ 
Say, O Muhammad Sallallahu that indeed my salah, my prayer, and my nusuk, my sacrificing, وَمَحْيَايَ and my living, وَمَمَاتِ and my dying, is for Allah, the Lord of the worlds. Everything of my life is for Allah. And that's why we remember and mention Allah Azza wa Jal at the time of death. Then he mentioned the next hadith, the hadith of Hudayfa radiallahu ta'ala anhu, where he said, An Hudayfa taqal, كان النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم إذا أوى إلى فراشه قال اللهم باسمك أحيا وأموت وإذا أصبح قال الحمد لله الذي أحيانا بعدما أماتنا وإليه النشور حذيف رضي الله تعالى عنه said when the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم went to bed he used to say Allahumma bismika ahya wa amut. And when he woke up in the mornings, he used to say, Alhamdulillah alladhi ahyana ba'dama amatana wa ilayhi nushur. Tayyib. The narrator of this hadith is Hudayfa ibn al-Yaman. Radiyallahu ta'ala anhu. Hudayfa ibn al-Yaman, my brothers and sisters, was from the major sahaba. And he was from the ulama, the scholars of the Sahaba. And it is narrated that he said, Hudayfa ibn al-Yaman radiallahu anhu said, the people used to ask Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam about the good, about the khair. Hudayfa said that all the people used to ask the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam about the good so that they can do it. I used to like to learn what is good so that they can do it. He said, as for me, I would always ask him about the evil out of fear of falling into it. And that's why Hudayfa ibn al-Yaman radiallahu anhu was unmatched in knowledge of the fitan. He had the most knowledge of the fitan from the Sahaba. Why? Because he said it himself. I used to always ask the Prophet ﷺ about the evil so that I can learn it to stay away from it. And that is why he was known as Sahib al-Sir, the secret keeper of Muhammad ﷺ. Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam kept his secrets with Hudayfa ibn al-Yaman. How big of a sahabi must he be to hold the secrets of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, not even Abu Bakr and Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhuma held his secrets. But Hudayfa ibn al-Yaman had them and that was an honor for him. And the Prophet Sallallahu left with him the names of the Munafiqeen. He left with him 70 names of the hypocrites of Medina. And no one knew them except Hudayfa. And that's why after the death of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu ta'ala anhu, whenever there was a janazah, for the Muslims, he used to check, is Hudayfa praying on this person or not? Because he knew Hudayfa had the list. And one time, Umar asked Hudayfa radiallahu anhu, he said to him, I ask you by Allah, am I on that list? And that's Umar ibn al-Khattab. He feed nifaq, hypocrisy. So Hudayfa ibn al-Yaman radiallahu anhu, he said to him, no, you are not on the list. He said, and by Allah, I will not inform anyone else after you. Yani, no one can come and ask me, are you on the list or are you not on the list? He told Umar and Umar only. 
and it's narrated that a man asked Hudayfa radiallahu anhu, what is the greatest fitna? Yani subhanallah, the people knew that he had knowledge of the fitan. So, a man asked Hudayfa radiallahu anhu, what is the greatest fitna? And what did Hudayfa answer? Subhanallah, what an answer. He said, the greatest fitna is when good and evil are presented to a person to choose from and he does not know which one to choose. Because of confusion and corruption in the world. The good and the evil are presented to a person and he does not know which is good and which is evil. That's the greatest fitna. Hudayfa radiallahu anhu said, that's why when Allah makes the truth clear to your eyes, always thank Him for guidance. Always. That Allah Azza wa Jal guided you to the truth. So Hudayfa radiallahu anhu was not an ordinary sahabi. He had a lot of knowledge, especially regarding the fitan. And we all know the famous story of Umar ibn al-Khattab, radiallahu ta'ala anhu, when he came to the group of the Sahaba and Hudayfa was amongst them. And he asked them, who can tell me about the fitan? Umar asked, who can tell me about the fitan? So one of the Sahaba said, a person... Uh, uh, the fitan, a person gets fitan in his wealth and his family and his children and whatever else. Then Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu said, I'm not asking about this. He said, I'm asking about the fitan that hit like the waves of oceans. So then Hudayfa ibn al-Yaman radiallahu anhu understood and he said to Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu, he said, why are you asking about this? He said, between you and these fitan is a great door. So Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he asked Hudayfa, he said, and the door, is it going to be open or will it be destroyed so that the fitan go through? So Hudayfa radiallahu anhu said, it will be destroyed. So Umar said, if it's destroyed, then it can never close again. And he walked off. No one understood that conversation except Umar and Hudayfa radiallahu ta'ala anhu. When Umar walked off, the other companions, they asked Hudayfa, what's this fitan and door? And so Hudayfa radiallahu anhu said, the door is Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu meaning when Umar radiallahu anhu dies the doors of fitan will open and they will not close because Umar was a door closing the fitan and he was and as soon as he died the fitan started with the khilafah of Uthman radiallahu ta'ala anhu uh, I advise you all to read on the life of Hudayfa ibn al-Yaman radiallahu ta'ala anhu. He was a great companion. Inshallah, next week, we will take the explanation of this hadith where the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa taught us to make this, hadith, uh, make this dua at the time of sleep. Allahu a'lam wa sallallahu wa sallam wa barak ala nabiyyina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. Al-Bayan Radio, the voice of Ahl-Sunnati wal-Jama'ah.